Welcome to another video of Geospinach. Today in military science we're going to talk about air power in war, its mean and its uses. We're going to talk about air superiority, reconnaissance, ground support, strategic bombing, logistical support, how all of this links to the armed forces, give some practical examples, the value of anti-air as well, and most importantly, uh, how effective or not effective they can be and for in what cases. Now, going directly into the video, we can start with air superiority. What we imply by air superiority? It implies having control of the air, either on your territory, the enemy, or both. You can have total air superiority, means you completely control the air. Partial air superiority, where you might have a lead at some specific cases, or you can have no air superiority, but the ability to contest. So contested air superiority. What we observe, for example, today in Ukraine is a situation of a contested air superiority where Russia has partial air superiority above Ukraine, but absolute or partial absolute air superiority above its own forces, while Ukraine has contested air superiority above its own forces. Once you have managed to achieve air superiority, and you do so through the means of fighter planes or fighter jets, that means fast-moving, high-tech, missile-equipped uh, planes that can destroy practically anything that flies in the sky. Following up by achieving, once you have managed to achieve air superiority, you have reconnaissance. Reconnaissance acts directly in congestion with the army along with the air. Here, reconnaissance can be achieved by drones, big planes, even satellites. Is the idea to give a better image of what's going on. Now, before we move to ground support, a key here, in contrast to the American school of war, air power by itself does not win wars. Air power acts as a multiplier of firepower. And this is where uh, fighter ground support uh, comes in. Once you have managed to achieve air superiority, once you have managed to achieve uh, reconnaissance, then you start use ground support planes to directly provide you with firepower. Ground support will be drones, helicopters, or just normal attack, attack planes like the A-10. The, each one of these has different levels of firepower that I can provide, accuracy and so forth. The idea though is that these things act as a fast moving, very preci precise based uh, ability to hit a target and provide immediate firepower. This can be very deadly and effective on an open field, mobile moving troops. For example, I ha can have a division, let's say it's an armored division, and it's moving from place A to place B. While it's taking its route, if you have air superiority above that area and the reconnaissance, so you know that, mo that unit is moving, if you hit that mobile unit while it's moving, its attack can be devastating. So it can destroy it like 40, 60, even 80% of its force. So it can be really, really devastating in war. But when it comes to entrenched positions, then we have a completely different case, where in entrenched position, air superiority, ground support, has a moral, has a moral effect than anything else. So, uh, since we moved away from that, let's get into uh, strategic bombing. Now, strategic bombing is something that's different by itself. So, strategic bombing, mainly what it does, is the ability, its aim is to demoralize the enemy, as well as destroy its energy, its industry, its logistical network. But we're going to make a different video about it. The idea that a bobber will always push through doesn't always uh, hold true, and it's like a tilting point. So you have, uh, from one side, the morale of the population, and on the other side, the breaking point. The more you bomb the uh, country but has a very high morale, then you might have the inverse effect of increasing morale. 
But once you bomb maybe too much, then you have the tipping point where the population becomes massively demoralized. And we've seen both examples in war. For example, in uh, modern war in Iraq, for example, you had a very demoralized effect, while in World War II, ironically enough, they had a more moralized or either neutral effect on the war. So strategic bombing, which is also very expensive, rarely has uh, very huge effects outside of directly of the battlefield. And then we move to logistical support, which kind of acts on its own, uh, and it comes with unisons with either directly supplying troops or throwing paratroopers in. It's just to make the whole supply situation easier. Now, while you can have specialized equipment for each one of these jobs, what truly happens in war is that one can do the job of the other. Practically all of this, so all of these planes, airplanes, and uh, can do the job of reconnaissance. The thing is, the specialized reconnaissance vehicles just do this job much better. The same applies for ground support. Now, for ground support, Normal fighter planes can provide air uh, to ground support and especially with specialized uh, missiles, air to ground missiles. The problem is they have a limitation to how much they carry, limitation in armor, anti-air and so forth to the point that they are not truly that effective. A helicopter in an air that has massive air superiority can be massively devastating on the defendant, while a fighter plane can, yes, throw two, three, best case, four missiles and do some damage equivalent to four artillery, round, artillery rounds, but that's practically it. So specialization in this case has quite a lot of value, but it really depends on the type of a nation. A nation that doesn't have the resources should mainly focus on creating just air superiority, so focuses on buying a lot of fighter planes. If it has managed to achieve air superiority, then it can use those planes for ground support and reconnaissance. A much richer nation that already possesses the resources can have the specialized equipment to do all. But a nation that has a neither so doesn't have the resources, it still has a solution. And that solution will be anti-air. Anti-air, it's uh, many people don't give value to it because but anti-air is the key in many cases for air combat. And we're gonna see a scenario why that is the key. Anti-air destroys anything that moves in the air. That will imply that even if you have the most expensive aircraft in the world, the majority of anti-aircraft missiles can destroy that plane. So one of the priori primary objectives before you start any military operation is to be able to destroy the defender's anti-air ability. And in most cases, anti-air is much, much cheaper than air power. So anti-air in many cases is the key. But here comes the issue. If you are the defendant and you are in generally a poorer nation, paying to get a lot of anti-air is the key to your victory since your victory will imply defense. But if you are attacking and you don't have air support and the enemy does, then you have what you call the area which the it's called the defense umbrella of the air support. The majority of good air support equipment are stable and they're not very mobile and you want them to be hidden so you can just move them around easily. That implies they provide an umbrella, here I highlight, of where they protect. So once your units move away from that umbrella, where the enemy has air superiority, then the enemy can start using his air superiority to cause devastating effects on your own forces. And we might see that exact scenario in Ukraine today, where Ukraine, above its own troops, has on an umbrella of defense, which is pretty good, but if it does manage to break the enemy lines and goes to the exploitation phase, it might be quite hard to actually be effective in that exploitation phase in an area where Russia has an absolute air superiority and it's able to cause devastating effects on moving 
forces, especially, especially armored forces. So air ground support is mainly and primarily good to destroying logistics and armor units. Infantry comes to the side, but as the Russians say, infantry come, it's quite cheap. Now let's see a more simplistic example. Let's say we, have, we are Team Black here. So Team Black, the first job of its air force, before it has two choices, either directly support the first days of the war, the units attacking, so while the forces are attacking at one direction, the air force can the, provide immediate air superiority on this area and attack the enemy positions. But as we said prior, those positions will most probably be entrenched, so the effect will be mainly on morale, but nothing more, so de thus decreasing organization. But outside of that, if they don't manage to break the enemy line and exploit it, then we come to a situation where the attacker, as Russia has found itself, will manage to push a bit the line, but then the enemies on air will start providing quite a good support, and then it will be quite hard to utilize surprise to destroy the enemy's anti-air. So one of the primary objectives from once you begin war, and specifically when it comes to strategic bombing, accompanying with attacking logistics, is the ability to destroy enemy anti-air positions. So in the first days of the war, actually your air force might not be even assisting your actual uh, infantry and armor that's doing the combat because it's primarily focused to destroy the logistics and the anti-air as for them to be able later on in the war to actually provide the necessary air power that they will uh, they will need and this is a very 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 important key that even more than Russian even modern uh, Russian generals kind of forgot about so they used they are air power in the very early stages of the war to attack Ukrainian ground targets and they did quite a lot of damage but once the surprise and the shock of the war were off and Ukrainian counter anti-air came into force then the Russian air force started suffering quite tremendous losses and as a result they had to retreat their whole uh, air behind the enemy's umbrella of air defense. We also see this in the Israeli war of 1956 after they crossed the Suez and, and so forth. So it's very, very, very vital to destroy the enemy's anti-air before achieving air superiority. So what do you have learned today? The most important thing is if you are the attacker, you need air superiority to be able to exploit the enemy. That means that once you have managed to break the line and you're moving in to do an encirclement or to capture an objective and the other side tries to respond to your move, then you can attack him while they are responding, giving you the ability to do your job and at the same time attack him and not allow him to be entrenched. So constantly demoralizing and decreasing uh, its morale. But if you are the defendant, then you should mainly focus on having basic aircraft accompanied with anti-air just to not allow the enemy to have this ability. And one small tool here, which I didn't mention, some anti-air, especially anti-air cannons, which many people dismiss in modern times, which is quite a mistake, are very, very useful because modern aircraft are very expensive, but actually because of their design, their ability to go to Mach 1 and Mach 2 speeds, uh, they are so volatile to even the smallest amount of fire that and when they come to the point to attack a ground target, they are very volatile. So any type of small arms anti-air non-missile system can destroy even a fighter jet and quite cheaply so but it gives you the extra benefit that the anti-cannon air system, for example, the 88mm the Germans have, can also provide direct firepower for your own unit. I just wanted to remind the audience uh, of this because this is quite a vital uh, point.
Now, thank you again for watching. Do consider like and subscribing. If you have any ideas, questions for me to answer, I'm gladly uh, willing to do so. And thank you for watching.